Um, tonight, I want to start out by um, thinking about people that we love to hate. It's, uh, it's kind of a funny thing, because it's, it's like, I don't just dislike the person, but uh, I've made it a hobby to dislike the person. Like, I take a lot of joy in disliking that person. And there's some people around that we just, it, it seems like right now, people love to hate. I'm going to show you a few pictures. Uh, this guy, I know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about her? Uh, yeah. Um, he's, some do, some don't. Uh, <laughs> you're old. Uh, how about this guy? <laughs> oh! You know, um, Listen, Nicolas Cage is playing Nicolas Cage in a movie that's coming up. He's playing himself because he's that wonderful. Uh, uh, how about the Kardashians? Um, okay, listen, 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 listen. But most of all, I think we could all agree. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why, listen. I don't know why, what it is exactly that makes us take such pleasure in hating on somebody, but some people just seem like they're asking for it, right? Uh, it's just real easy for a crowd to, to get against them. Um, and I'm not sure why that is, but even in our country, um, you see that, that even politics these days are getting so weird that instead of us all kind of being in the middle together, it's kind of pushing us to one side or another. And people seem real divided, like against liberal folks versus uh, conservative folks and red states versus blue states and Republicans versus Democrats. And, and some places in the country get hated on because of, of their political views. And I'm sure it goes both ways, but like, Right now in the Bible Belt, where we live, there is a lot of, of hating on, like, West Coast California that's going on just because of differences. California. Yes. <laughs> it's the life on me. Um, yeah. It's, um, people see Hollywood or people's political views, and they kind of put the whole state into that same basket and, and love to hate on California. And, and things happen out there, like they've had wildfires and earthquakes and, and there's homelessness. And, and when people hate on California, all of a sudden there's not very much compassion when they have problems, they have issues like that. I heard someone say, I wish California would just slip into the ocean. And, and I thought, okay, well there it is. Uh, there it is, people have been hating on the West Coast what happens when we hate on someone or some group of people is that we make us, um, listen, we make us normal and we make them weird, right? As, as soon as we start hating on somebody, I am, I am right and you're wrong. I'm normal and you're strange. I'm good and you're bad. And that's kind of the thing that starts to set up in our heads or in our hearts. Last week, Joe was talking about us um, drawing a dividing line between us and them. Uh, based on our differences, and, and we see ourselves as two different teams and not together because of our differences. But I think we go even farther than that, and we start to make things like us or them, and we force a choice to happen. Um, just to remind you, uh, if I can spell it right, um, us or them, and you think like only one of us is going to get our way, and it's either me or it's them. It's almost me versus them and so I start rooting for them to fail and and it's it's bordering on loving to hate somebody and you'll see it if if uh, in a friendship group uh, you try to get all your friends against that person and on your side and and you're kind of winning because everybody's standing with you and leaving that person alone um, that is a great example of us or them we both can't exist in the same place we think and um, it, maybe you had an older sibling when you were growing up, 
and they did something, they were mean to you like they always are, they smacked you, they took your toy, they told you to shut up, and you're like, I'm going to get them. Because you learned at an early age, it's us or them, right? So you're like, Mom, they smacked me, or she said this about me, she told me to shut up, and your mom's like, you're both in trouble. She's like, I didn't do anything wrong at all. Why am I in trouble? Because you told on them. Um, and you try to win, but you end up both getting in trouble. We are always making it us or them, us versus them. It's a mindset of dis division. You ever heard someone say, either they go or I go? Either the cat goes or I go. I, yes. So far in this series, we've been talking about uh, a couple things. And you remember, God is for us, week one. And God is for others, from Joe, last week, week two. Um, and it's not always easy to do. Tonight, I want you to hear one last thing. God is for you, but he's also for your enemies. God is for your enemies. And we need to see tonight how um, we can go uh, from a mindset of us or them to a mindset of us for our enemies. This is going to be the hardest thing. Everybody wants to hear that God is for them. But everybody does not want to hear that we are to be for our enemies, because that is hard to do. I want to, um, I want to show you something by looking at another place that a lot of people love to hate. It's not California. Hey there. Another place that people love to hate on. It wasn't California, um, but it was a, a big place, and God was the only one for this city, okay? Nobody else was for this city, and God's going to do something surprising. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard uh, the name Jonah before. A lot of you probably heard the name Jonah. And when you hear about Jonah, you also hear about the whale. The whale, right. The whale's not the main part of the story, though, but, but it's a cool part of the story. Um, the main part of the story is that God calls Jonah to go to this city that was a really rough city called Nineveh to go and preach to them and minister to them and get in their business because they were killing themselves. And he wanted Jonah to go and wake them up um, so that they would be spared from God's, God's wrath. And Nineveh was like, as a city, it was like the bad boy of the school. It was smoking in the bathroom. Um, and, uh, and Nineveh was not, like you didn't go on family vacation to Nineveh. Uh, you went there for your bachelor party, um, but you, you didn't take your wife and kids to Nineveh. It wasn't, it wasn't a, like a family-friendly town. Um, and it was a huge place with a terrible reputation. And a lot of people hated Nineveh uh, in addition to Jonah. Why'd they hate it so much? Because Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire had conquered Israel, God's people. And when they conquered them, they committed horrible, horrible war crimes against Israel, against the women, against the children. Horrible, the Assyrian Empire. And so Jonah, on behalf of his people, absolutely hated Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. Um, and was that understandable? Sure it was. So in, in Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 2, God's like, hey, I want you to go preach to Nineveh. He's like, no way am I going to preach to Nineveh. You have lost your mind, God. Like, did you not remember what they did to us and we're your children? No, I'm not going there. So he went um, to the harbor and he got on a boat. And he went the opposite direction from Nineveh. And he's sailing away um, when this horrible storm comes up. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because Nineveh is the enemy. And so he's on the ship trying to escape, and this storm comes up, and they're going to sink. The boat is going to sink. They're all going to die until the other people on the ship realize that Jonah is running away from God. And they're like, you know what? I bet this storm is God. We'll throw him overboard and see if the weather gets better. And they threw him overboard and... The weather got better. God sent this huge fish, a what? A whale to swallow up Jonah and basically deliver him to shore safely after a couple days. Uh, and maybe the whole thing seems crazy. God uses the craziest methods to deliver us. It's not beyond God's power to use a whale to save Jonah. And sometimes, um, it's funny that, that the very thing that maybe to you in the moment feels like life is falling apart, like I bet Jonah was feeling in the, in the middle of the fish, the very thing that you feel like is life falling apart might be 
a whale that God ordered to take you to his beach and drop you off. It might be the very thing that you needed to go wrong so that you're willing to turn and come back to God. For Jonah, it was the storm and the whale. It was like, God was like, hey, go to, go to Nineveh and preach. And Jonah was like, no. And he gets on the ship, and God's like, okay, I'm going to pick up your ship, and I'm going to shake it until you fall out. And he did. And then God's like, do an Aquaman with the whale. He's like, I want you to go pick him up. No chewing. Uh, go pick him up, swallow him whole, and then drop him off at the harbor so that I can use him. And in the whale, Jonah repents. He turns. He's like, God, if you give me a second chance, I'll go and preach. So the whale spit him out, and he went to Nineveh, and he preached. He was like, hey, repent of your sins, or God will destroy the city. Have you ever done something poorly because you didn't want to do it, and you didn't want to be asked to do it again? I picture Jonah just being like, repent. The end is nigh. The hour is coming. But even if he did a horrible job at it, what happened is the king took it to heart. And the king told his people, we are taking this message to heart. We're going to change our ways so that God doesn't destroy us. Who would have seen that coming? This horrible city. The enemy found God, basically, because Jonah went there and preached. Some people are super surprised about Kanye becoming a Christian. Kanye becoming a Christian has nothing on Nineveh finding religion and turning to God. Nineveh changing their ways is like Hitler doing puppet ministry for preschool BBS kids. I mean, it is the least likely scenario from an evil, evil city. And they turned. The enemy turned because God used Jonah to do it. Verse 10 says, when God saw um, what, they had, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. That means he changed. He, he let up. And he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So that's a miracle, right? Everybody's happy, end of the story? No. Jonah is so angry that they're saved. Jonah is ticked off that God didn't destroy them. Can you imagine? Jonah wanted his enemies to burn, and now he's thinking, now it's my fault that these evil people are enjoying grace because I went and preached to them. He is so mad. Like, he hated them so much he wanted to see them die. The dude was beside himself. Jonah 4.3 says this. This is Jonah talking to God. Now, Lord, take my life away from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Okay, let's look at what's going on. Jonah was so me or them that he wanted the city to burn. And when he went there and preached and God spared them, then Jonah wanted God to take his life instead. It's me or them. And if you're going to let them live, then I want you to take my life. It didn't matter that God miraculously saved Jonah. It didn't matter that God miraculously took this evil city and had them change their hearts and their ways. He could not see it because he was so blinded by his hatred for his enemy. What he missed is that in hating them, he was just as guilty as they were. In running away from God, he was just as guilty as they were. Um, listen, when we think about our enemies, we think about what they did to us, and we make them unique and different than us. I never did that. I never did that to them. They're horrible. You might not be guilty ever as the same thing that your enemy has done, but you're just as guilty of something as what your enemy has done to you. We all are. You'll always have a ton of reasons to hate an enemy. A laundry list of reasons why you should not like them. Jesus isn't going to take away all the reasons that you could hate somebody. Nineveh was still guilty of doing horrible things, even when God spared them. But you only need one reason to be for an enemy. It's not because um, they deserve it. It's because God is for them. If God is for our enemies then we can be for our enemies, even when they don't deserve it. He's not for the bad things they've done. He's for them in spite of the bad things that they've done. And you can try to run away from it like he did, but God's still for your enemies. God calls us to be for everyone, our greatest enemies. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still, what? 
sinners. One more time. When we were still what? When we were still sinners. When I was still a sinner and you were, Christ died for us. When we were enemies of God, God sent us Christ to pull us back to him. He was for us when we were against him. He gave us compassion. He gave us love. He didn't love to hate on us. He loved to love on us before we ever came to him. And God's message to me and you is the same as it was to Jonah. Hey, I'm for you, but I'm also for your enemies. And I want you to be for your enemies. That's not easy to do. You might have experienced something terrible from somebody. You might be angry about it and hurt by it. And I'm sorry that people in your life have done something terrible to you. Some of you guys in the, in the group um, have endured stuff uh, that you shouldn't have to endure. And, and if, you've never, if you've never shared that with an adult, if, if someone has hurt you to the extent um, that it's changed your life and, and you've never shared that with an adult, um, you need to find a table leader or a safe adult to share that with and begin walking through that process. Because you shouldn't do it alone and you can't do it alone. But if you have an enemy for any other reason than that, if someone made fun of you or cheated off your homework or took your boyfriend or um, told lies about you, then I invite you to have a conversation with God about uh, the same thing that, that Jonah did, and that's trying to be for your enemy. Um, when I hear the word enemies, um, I think of some famous pairs of, of uh, entertainment enemies that are out there, some villains just need the hero to give them a little bit of love, like, uh, like here are a few, uh, the genie and Jafar, uh, Ariel and Ursula, uh, Hulk and Loki, Luke Skywalker and his father, Mario and Bowser, Vanellope and Ralph, Mr. Incredible and Syndrome, or maybe you're into Snow White and the evil queen, or Frodo and Gollum, look at the hair on his feet. Um, Gingy and the Cookie Monster, uh, or Deadpool and Deadpool, or Joker and Batman. Yeah, everybody has an enemy. Everybody has an enemy. If you're not sure who yours are, I want you to listen to these questions and think for just a second. Who's hurt me in my life? Who who haven't I forgiven? Who annoys me to no end and I just tighten up when they walk around, when they come around? Who would I love to see fail? Who do I wish everyone else would dislike as much as I dislike? Who's in my circle but I'm kind of low-key against them um, and we're, we're frenemies? Um, Maybe we've got history that we never got over, where they never apologize for something stupid they did, where they keep doing the same stupid stuff over and over again, but we're still in the same circle of friends. Whoever you thought of, even if they don't know it, those are the people that you've made into your enemies. And if you really want to see your heart change toward them, if you really want to learn to be for them like God is for them, um, then I, I want to make a visual reminder tonight um, of, of how that relationship is supposed to look. Take out a, a, one of your note cards and a pen for a second here. A blank note card. Instead of starting on the left side like we normally do, I'm going to have you start on the right-hand side of your note card. Listen, try to do it silently. Try to do it silently if you can. I want you just to write a little symbol that for you will represent your enemy. Uh, it could be a square or a circle or something. You could, oh, yeah, I, I just kept mine anonymous by just putting AC. Um, uh, and, and you can write one of their initials or something in there, but, but that's just going to remind you who, who you're thinking about. No one else will know what it means or who that is at all. Totally private. And then just to the left of that symbol or their name or their initials or whatever, I want you to write the word for. Real big, underline it. It's going to say for that person. And you've still got some space to the left to do one, one couple last things. For that person. We're working from the end to the start. Okay? 
And then as a reminder, uh, upper left, you're going to write God is. So, so when you look at that, you see first God is for AC. For whoever your person is. Is Adam your mortal enemy too? And last, and I don't want you just to do this because you're just writing something down on a piece of paper. I, I really pray this means something to you because you're making a commitment to God to say, okay, God, this doesn't make sense to me, but if you're calling me to, then I am for that person. And just commit to it and say, God, I am for that person and write that in. Maybe it's no fun to be reminded that God is for that person that you don't want to be for. And you don't want anyone to be for them. Maybe tonight you need to tell God, hey, it doesn't seem fair that, that you want me to love them. Maybe you say, God, change my mind. It's, 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 it's not fair that I have to love my enemies, God. Change my mind. And, and I, I don't mean it just as a joke, but that you're open to God to say, I'm admitting I don't want to do this, but I'm also admitting I know you want me to. You can pray, God, help me transform the way that I see them. Listen, this is important. What most people pray is God transform them so they're not an idiot anymore. But what we need to pray is God transform the way that I see them and the way that I treat them. Don't expect God to change them. Ask for God to change us. What would it look like for you to be for them? First start by praying for them. Just pray for them. You don't even have to tell them you're praying for them. You just pray and let God change your heart. Second, don't talk about them. Don't talk to other people about them. Don't bring them up. Don't say what you heard about them. Third, talk to them. Maybe you could greet them when you see them. And that's all you can force yourself to do at the beginning. Like, hey, California, I see you. How's it going? Just, just greet them. Maybe uh, you move beyond that and you go further and you ask them about something that you know they like doing. It's just being kind to them. Not to start a fight, just to be kind to them. And then you work toward forgiving them. If they don't know they did anything wrong to you, or they don't think they did anything wrong to you, don't tell them you forgave them. You don't need to convince them first that they did something wrong. Someone did that to me once. They sent me a long email trying to convince me that I'd done them wrong and then tell me that they forgave me for it. I still didn't believe them. <laughs> You're not going to win them over to convince them what they did wrong. If they don't see it, you just forgive them between you and God. If they know they messed you over, then sit down with them. Hear them out and say, I just want to let you know I do forgive you and I want to get past it. And the two of you move. And last is just build on it. It's hard work. It's totally opposite of the way we were born to want to love people that are our enemies, that hurt us. But God says, I am for you and I'm for them. Listen, ladies, I am for, I know you got drama in your friendship group. You told me about it. So listen, I'm for you and I'm for that girl who doesn't like you or said this or that about you. I'm for both of you. And I want you guys to be for each other. Life is too short to be versus them or against them. It is me for them. It is us for them. This week, watch what God does when you start to replace our natural enemy relationship with love and with compassion instead of hate and or and verses and against and dividing lines. I want you to stand up, if you would, and come on forward, and we're going to sing together and worship God.